Hi everyone, we're back with Medieval China and the Far East. Now in a prior lecture I sort of briefly talked about the Song and the Tong dynasties. I want to circle back now and go into a little bit more detail on the medieval period in Chinese history. After the collapse of the Han Dynasty, we see a long period of division in Chinese history, several centuries from the 3rd to the 6th century, where we have a lot of internal fighting in the region. A lot of factional fighting at the imperial court. Uh, the influence of court officials, who now number in the thousands, mean that there's a lot of internal jealousies which have weakened uh, the leadership from within. You have the rise of regional warlords, each one seeking autonomy and independence in their own little area of control. You also have external threats arising. By the late 3rd century, northern Han lands are gradually being overrun by tribal groups, nomadic steppe societies like the Swang Ni, Turkic people who were excellent on horseback were breaking up Han leadership in the north and setting up divided regional kingdoms. So all this disunity, popular rebellions, this, uh, you know, arguing uh, over leadership at the top levels, the assassination of the second Sui Emperor Yang Ti in 618, all these things are gradually paving the way for the rise of the Tang Dynasty. The Tang Dynasty is often referred to as a high point in Chinese civilization. Um, you end up seeing a lot of territory acquired through the military success of its early rulers, even greater than that of the Han. A huge capital city of Chang'an, some two million residents during the period, was a very cosmopolitan place. A lot of foreign visitors into the capital city from Vietnam, Syrians, Japanese res uh, uh, emissaries, Indians, Persians. You would have had an interesting cultural, ethnic, and religious mix in many of these Tong cities. For example, Judaism and Christianity have made their way to China by the time of the Tong dynasty. There's a tremendous emphasis on Confucian scholarship during this period. Learning and the arts flourished. Buddhism came into the region and really took hold during the Tong period. Block printing was invented during Tong leadership, making the written word available to a vastly greater audience. Metalworking was becoming more advanced. The use of the crossbow in, for military purposes, the development of coal as fuel, porcelain, silk, and tea became major export items under Tong leadership. The Tong Code is a legal code that was set up under the leadership of Tong uh, uh, rulers during this period, established around 624 CE. The code is an interesting blend or fusion of legalism and Confucianism. And it was composed of 12 sections of laws containing more than 500 articles. It gradually became the basis for later dynastic codes not only in China but in other areas of East Asia over time. There's a tremendous emphasis in the Tong Code on loyalty to family elders and government officials. For instance, there were much harsher penalties assessed for someone who harmed or killed a family member versus just killing a random stranger. Also under the Tang Dynasty, we see the only female Chinese empress take control, that of Wu Zhejian. Wu was born into a rich and noble family. She was given an education as a young woman and could read and write and understood all the Chinese classics of literature, something that was a little unusual for the time. By 13 years old, she was known for her wit, intelligence, and beauty, and was recruited to the court of Emperor Tai Tsung. She soon became his favorite concubine, and uh, he even sort of made her his own personal secretary. But she also had eyes for his son, Kao Tsung, which is kind of gross when you think about it, but whatever. When the emperor died and his son, Kao Tsung, took over, Wu now tried to steer herself into the good graces of the new emperor. She was 27 years old and she achieved her goal. She became his favorite concubine, giving birth to the sons that he wanted. As mother of the future emperor of China, she grew in power. She even managed to eliminate Kao Tsung's legal wife, Empress Wang, by accusing her of killing Wu's newborn daughter. She was thirsty for some power, let's just put it that way. Eventually, they were able, she was able to marry the emperor, and several years afterwards, he suffered a crippling stroke, and she took this as an opportunity to assume power all into herself. 
When he eventually passed away, she outflanked her eldest sons and moved her youngest, much weaker son, into power and ruled in his name. She, in effect, was the ruler, not her young son. She took the throne in her own name in 690 and remains the only woman in the 2100 years of imperial China, China to ever use the title emperor. She organized successful military campaigns in the Korean Peninsula. She earned the respect of her army in the process. She removed incompetent government officials, which earned her the respect of the people. She reopened the Silk Road. She took suggestions from commoners about reforms that were needed. She redistributed land to the poor, which earned her the immense loyalty of those who were suffering in Tong society. She uh, instigated public works to build irrigation canals. There's a, certainly a darker side to her rule, though. She created a secret police force to spy on her opposition. She cruelly jailed or killed anyone who stood in her way, including, for example, the Empress Wang. Yet it worked for her. When spies reported unrest, she was able to quickly stop any potential rebellions and keep the peace. Yet, according to the Chinese dynastic cycle, all dynasties will eventually come to an end. As in previous periods, gradually warfare and internal struggles for power made life difficult for the peasants in Tong-era China. We begin to see a series of peasant uprisings beginning in 860 CE, which will ultimately lead to the demise of the Tong dynasty and the rise of the Song dynasty. Now you might see Song spelled S-U-N-G or S-O-N-G, so please be aware of those two spellings. Song Dynasty is another example of a sort of cultural and intellectual high period in Chinese history. Once the warfare of previous generations finally begins to subside, we can see scholars getting back to work. During the Song Dynasty, great advances were made in the areas of technological invention, material production, political philosophy, government, and culture. The Song, for example, developed gunpowder as a weapon in siege warfare, they expanded their trade with foreign powers greatly, and the Chinese had some of the best equipped ships in the world. They navigated the oceans through the use of elaborate charts and magnetic compasses. Advances were also made in medicine as the first autopsy was performed in 1145 CE on the body of a southern captive, Chinese captive. Paper currency came into use. You've got multiple cities in Song-era China with populations over a million people. This is the most densely populated area of the world. They developed movable type and the use of the abacus, which is an early calculator. Despite these scientific advances, though, the Song were not militarily powerful. Part of the reason may be because they preferred the Confucian idea of intellectual achievement. They held the military in low regard. So we see a resurgence of nomadic groups in the north, the Yurkin, the Mongols, the Swang Ni, and so the Song had difficulty defending themselves. They tried to reason and talk with some of these groups rather than resorting to violence, but diplomacy does not work if your enemy is not willing to talk to you. Military weakness is part of the reason why the Song Dynasty will ultimately fall. Another part of the story is the failure of Wang Anxi's reforms. Wang Anxi was not an emperor, but he was chief counselor to the young emperor at the time, Shen Chuang. And after 20 years of loyal civil service in the southern provinces, he became aware of the growing serious financial problems with the Song Dynasty. So Wang Anxi tried to implement a series of reforms to stop the sustained economic decline and benefit those who were overlooked in society. He rolls out what he called his new policies. Among these policies was the idea that you should do away with the tax immunity of large landowners. The very wealthy landowners were used to not paying taxes on their holdings. This meant that the burden of taxation fell to the poor, those landless individuals, those who could least afford it. You can imagine when he wanted to raise taxes on the wealthy, this did not go over very well. He also created a state fund for low-interest agricultural loans to farmers, sparing them the exorbitant rates of money lenders. Now you can go to the state itself and get a low-interest loan to buy more land or seed or get your farming implements repaired, rather than having to resort to going to a private lender who's going to charge you much, much higher interest and you get trapped in a cycle of debt. 
He expanded educational opportunities for the poor. He opened up more government schools. He reformed the civil service exam system to, again, to try to increase the success of students from disadvantaged backgrounds to give them an opportunity to join civil service. From the standpoint of conservative bureaucrats, though, they liked the old system. They don't like Wang on Xi's new changes. So Wang was forced out of the Song Court in 1076, and many of his reforms just never materialized over time. What the elites didn't realize, though, is that Wang on Xi's reforms were actually modernizing China. By helping the poor, this would reduce future peasant rebellions. It would take some of the stress off, but they were too short-sighted to appreciate his vision. In 1125 CE, a group called the Jin were able to conquer uh, parts of the Song Empire. The empire was split, and eventually, here come the Mongols again. We'll talk more about the Mongols as we move forward in class. Now, I want to talk about a secondary state living kind of in the shadow of imperial China, that being the Korean Peninsula. There were several different kingdoms in the Korean Peninsula that had all been kind of fighting and vying for domination for centuries. And the one that eventually comes out on top is the Shia dynasty. The Shia gradually took a lead role among the city-states in the Korean Peninsula, and they will help to um, eventually forge an alliance with China's Tang Dynasty in the 7th century. The Shia Dynasty is the first indigenous ruled uh, kingdom in the Korean Peninsula. We haven't seen that. We've seen outsiders dominated, but we haven't seen the people themselves governing on their own behalf. We see this with the Shia, the first unified indigenous ruled Korean Empire. That being said, there's a tremendous number of influences, cultural, political, economic influences from mainland China. How could there not be? Buddhism and Confucianism made their way into the region over the centuries and would actually um, help to forge an incredibly rigid caste system uh, the, um, that would develop under the Shia dynasty, the so-called bone rank system. This was a very highly stratified social system that was developed in Korea under the Shia dynasty. Your bone rank status governed everything about your life, pretty much. It governed who you married, also even the color of your garments, the maximum dimensions or size of your dwelling and your carriage. Your job prospects were limited by your bone rank, uh, meaning that the higher up you went, the more opportunity you had, and then the reverse was true. The lower your rank in this rigid caste system, the more limited your opportunities for economic, political, and um, you know, social advancement were. Resentment and frustration began to build, especially among the poor. Rising number of peasant revolts over time meant that, meant that this is going to, the Sia dynasty is going to end up collapsing in on itself. It will be taken over by Gorea, another of these, of these um, uh, factions in the Korean Peninsula. And their, then their next big problem will, face, will be facing off with, of course, the Mong Mongols in the 13th century. Another secondary state, one that's growing up kind of um, under the domination and influence by a much larger primary state, uh, in this case China, will be Vietnam. It's another of these so-called secondary states in Southeast Asia. Humans have inhabited what is now Vietnam for more than 22,000 years. Lush rainforest, mountains, and fertile plains means it was the site of early agriculture in Southeast Asia. Archaeologists have unearthed, unearthed evidence showing early forms of bronze, cast, bronze casting as early as 5000 BC and rice cultivation by 2000 BCE. Vietnam will be strongly shaped by many cultural forces over time. To the west and to the south, Cambodian and Indian influences will leave deep imprints. In the south, the Hindu kingdom of Champa will emerge around present-day Da Nang in the late 2nd century CE. The Cham people there borrowed heavily from Indian art and culture, and this will be blended in with Vietnamese culture over time. However, the biggest cultural for force early on, especially in the northern parts of Vietnam, will come from China. The Chinese will begin as early as the 2nd century BCE, coming to dominate the northern regions of Vietnam. And during this period, large numbers of Chinese settlers, officials, and scholars moved south to impose a centralized state system on the Vietnamese. They imposed their writing system, 
They brought in Confucian ideals. And over time, the Vietnamese people will long for their independence. In the case of the Trung sisters, they will become heroes, in fact, for ousting the Chinese for a brief period of time. Unlike in China, where women had little political or military authority, in Vietnam, women held a much stronger societal status. For instance, women could take the role in, a lead role in selecting their spouse. They could have their spouse join their household instead of going to live with their husband's family. Vietnamese women could initiate divorce and inherit property in their own name. And there were many professions open to them, including trade as well as military service. Thus, during the first century CE, the Trung sisters, daughters of a powerful regional warlord, decided to use their influence to start a nationalist uprising. In a famous act of resistance in 40 CE, the Trung sisters rallied the people, raised an army of 80,000 soldiers, and led a revolt that sent the Chinese governor fleeing. Within a year, the sisters and their allies held 65 northern citadels. They became heroes for leading the first Vietnamese independence movement. Their reign did not last long, unfortunately. In 43 CE, the Han Chinese counterattacked. And the sisters, rather than suffer the indignity of surrender at the hands of their hated enemies, threw themselves into the Hot Gyeong River. Their courage, though, kept the Vietnamese independent movement alive. From the 3rd through the 6th centuries, for instance, there were numerous other small-scale failed rebellions against Chinese rule, but we continue to see the Vietnamese people valiantly fighting for their independence. Now, the early Vietnamese learned much from these other civilizations. The so-called three religions show a blending of Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism in Vietnam. Traveling Buddhist monks from India and China carried with them scientific and medical knowledge of these two great civilizations. And before long, Vietnam was producing its own great doctors, botanists, and scholars. The Chinese also introduced advanced building techniques, the construction of dikes and irrigation canals. But they still longed for their freedom from outside influence. And what they figured out is, is if you wait long enough, that Chinese dynastic cycle, as you begin to see the empire weakening from within, you wait. You wait for your chance when they're distracted, putting out internal fires. You wait for that, and then you use that as a chance to break away. The era of third Chinese domination, for example, eventually came to an end in 905 CE, when the Vietnamese broke away from an increasingly weak Tong Chinese government. The next big threat will come, of course, with the Mongol invasions during the mid-13th century. And the Mongol hordes uh, managed to come into areas of northern Vietnam, but were actually ultimately defeated <laughs> by the Vietnamese. The, the Vietnamese are tough, man. They, they uh, first repelled uh, Mon Mongol forces on, on, under Mongi Khan in 1257, and then they repelled Kublai Khan's forces two times, the first in 1284 and then again in 1287. But the Chinese, of course, are always coming back, and here's where Le the work of Le Loi is important. In 1418, Vietnamese general Le Loi sparked the Lam Som uprising. Although he was a wealthy upper-class landowner, Le Loi despised the Vietnamese aristocrats who collaborated with the Chinese governors of Vietnam. He considered them sellouts. Many, many commoners claimed gross mistreatment at the hands of the Chinese, and Le Loi chose a path of revolt against China's brutal government. He began rallying the people, and in 1427, after ten years of war, Vietnam regained its independence, and the Ming Empire in China were forced to officially acknowledge Vietnam as an independent state. He will help to establish the Lê Dynasty, a long-lived independent Vietnamese dynasty. This will carry them from the Middle Ages into the early modern era.